Amen. Well, I want to welcome you. Good morning. My name is Phil Chapman. Welcome to everyone online as well. Uh, we are uh, so glad to be here today. Uh, I serve as the online campus pastor and the connections pastor right here at Sugar Grove. And, and today I have a humbling opportunity to bring forth the good news that was presented to us by the disciple that Jesus loved, John. In fact, John, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he had a singular focus that, that we've alluded to numerous times from John chapter 20. He wants to use this writing so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. But I think that, that in this writing, the Holy Spirit had more than that one singular point. And I think R.C. Sproul, he said, it, he said it very well. He said, John wrote his gospel to convince people that Jesus is the Messiah. But the gospel, it also strengthens those who already know that Jesus is the Messiah. We read and we study John along with, with all the scriptures in the Bible all the days of our lives that we will be kept in the faith and become more confident, more confident in that we have found the very truth of God. And that's why we cannot neglect the reading and the studying of the scriptures. That's why you're with us today online. That's why you're with us here right this very moment so we can dig into God's word and that we can allow him to teach us. And today we're looking at a passage that has a tremendous significance for all the people that have ever lived, for all the people that currently live and all the people that will ever live. We're looking at, a, at an event in history that was absolutely horrendous, but absolutely wonderful. Today's scripture highlights an event that did not happen by chance. It wasn't by random circumstance. In fact, 1 Peter 1.20, 1 Peter 1.20 says, He, meaning Jesus, was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. For the sake of you. Jesus dying on the cross was the centerpiece of God's eternal plan for salvation for his people. It was the plan that he's had forever. We started this study in the Gospel of John on August 29th of last year. It's been a, a fun time to encourage me and to, to learn in depth more about this Gospel. And after today's message, we have four messages left. And we will have completed the entire Gospel of John. We started in John 1.1 1, 1, and have worked our way all, way all the way through to John 19. We remember that John the Baptist, the, the cousin of Jesus, in John 1.34, he said this, I have seen and borne witness that this is the Son of God. We, we think about when John the Baptist was in the water and he was baptizing people and he saw Jesus coming towards him to be baptized. And, and he shouted out and was so excited and he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What a great moment in time. And last week, last week, Pastor Tim, he, he taught us about the flogging, how Jesus got beat severely and he, and he kind of gave us a glimpse into Pilate's mind as it was working. Is this just a man? Or is this a king? Maybe a king of another world? Pilate was, was rather confused. And he didn't deal with Jesus righteously. He allowed himself to be blackmailed and sentenced Jesus to death. And that's where we pick up today, John chapter 19, starting with verse 17, where Jesus is heading to the cross. Now today I want to focus all we can on John 19, but I'm going to tell you, friends, we're going to do some Bible exercises. 
because we're going to be all around. I want to look at several scriptures so we get a full picture and to understand why our Savior came to this world. I have four reasons. Four reasons why Jesus came to this world. The first reason that Jesus came to this world is to save the lost. To save the lost. In the Gospel of, John, or Gospel of Luke, in, ver, in chapter 19, we meet a wee little man, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a tax collector, and, and he, he loved getting money. He loved storing money for himself and gathering that up, and, and, and he was probably not the best guy out there. But because he was so small in stature and he knew that Jesus was going to be walking by this popular guy, he wanted to get a, a glimpse of him. So Zacchaeus climbed up a tree and he looked down. And he's looking for him. And as Jesus walked by, he's like, oh, wow, there he is. But Jesus knew that Zacchaeus was up on that tree. He looked up there and said, Zacchaeus, come down. I want to go to your house. I want to have some dinner. So Zacchaeus is like, okay, well, let's go. You see, the religious people, they weren't happy about this because Jesus was supposed to be a teacher. How could a teacher go and spend his time with this person that wasn't good, this sinner, this person that was lost? So Jesus spent some time with them face to face and joined some food together. And as he was there, Zacchaeus started to get convicted. And Zacchaeus, he stood up and he looked at Jesus and he said, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I've done anything wrong, anything, if I've defrauded anyone, I'm going to give it back to him four times over. And then Jesus looked at Zacchaeus, and I bet he smiled. There was probably angels singing somewhere at this moment in time. And Je Jesus said to Zacchaeus, Today salvation has come to your house. For the Son of Man, he came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus told us in John 3, 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. He wanted to save the lost. That's why he came to this world. Paul told Timothy that Jesus came to the world to save sinners, to save those that were lost. Jesus, the great physician, he did not come to this world to heal the righteous, heal the healthy. He came to this world to heal the sick. To heal the lost. In fact, the scripture that we've been reading right here in this very chapter, we see many, many people that were lost. Pilate. Pilate. Pilate was lost. And Jesus came to this world to save people just like Pilate. Pilate was focused in on the world. He's focused in on power, focused in on satisfying man, on protecting himself. I think Pilate might have actually started thinking and maybe in, when he was interrogating Jesus, maybe like, oh my goodness, maybe I am lost. Maybe this is a good guy. His, wife, his wife's dream and, and, and when Jesus said he, was, he had a kingdom of, of another world, maybe he was being convicted, but, but he gave in. The chief priests, they were lost. They were lost. They were so focused in on the rules of religion that they forgot to, to even see that the ruler of all the world was standing in front of them. They were so brilliant that they memorized most of the Old Testament, but they forgot instead of hiding it in their hearts, they hid it in their head. They were lost. The crowd the crowd was lost there at the crucifixion. They were shouting at him, hurling insults at him. Just a week ago, they were shouting out, maybe many of them, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, this is so great. But Jesus was canceled by the culture. He was no longer popular. 
He was no longer the man. So they got in that rhythm to shout at him and mock him. The criminals, the one on the left and the one on the right, they didn't have any hope. And so instead, they yelled and hurled insults at him, the one that was nailed between them. Matthew 27. Matthew 27 in the New International Version, it captures these lost people pretty well. Starting with verse 39 in Matthew 27, it says, Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the, the teachers of the law and the elders, they mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. <laughs> He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we'll believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. And in the same way, the rebels, plural, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Jesus came into this world to save the rebels. He came into this world to save the the crowd. He came to this world to save the conniving chief priests and Pontius Pilate. Any one of these people and any one of us, anyone who's watching this, Jesus knows that it is a tragedy if you're lost. It's an absolute tragedy. In all these examples, we see a lot of hostility thrown at Jesus. They are throwing out words and, and they are angry at him. But it's interesting to think about what William Barclay wrote. He said this, the tragedy is not the hostility of the world to Christ. The tragedy is the world's indifference which treats the love of God as if it did not matter. I'm here to tell you with tremendous confidence that Jesus came to this world to show his love. To show his love. And we should pay close attention to it. John 13, 34 says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. One of my favorite verses in all of Scripture is Galatians 2, 20. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I live in the flesh, I live through faith in the Son of God who loved me and died for me. Throughout the ministry of Jesus, we see Jesus' love so much as he healed the sick and the lame, as he fed thousands and thousands of people as he proclaimed the great message of his kingdom in heaven, and as he cast out demons. In fact, Mary Magdalene, who's, who's standing right there before him, while he's being crucified, she had seven demons within her, and he cast them out. Luke at chapter 8, verses 1 through 2, they share this wonderful story. Luke 8 Soon afterward, he went on through the cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. Jesus loves these people. He loves the lost. He loves the people that come to him. The moment that Jesus was on this cross, he was in excruciating pain. Pastor Tim painted the picture a little bit last week of all the pain that he was suffering. I won't go into great detail about that, but it is horrific. Not only that, and maybe more than that, Jesus has taken on all the sins of all the people and he is being forsaken. That is a horrible moment in time. 
And even during this, Jesus shows tremendous compassion and love towards his mother. He looks down and he sees his mother in verse 26. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple, that's John, whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. I've got a couple observations of this moment in time. Jesus refers to his mother as woman. We see that there was an actual a separation that happened in John chapter 2 at the wedding in Cana. He refers to his mother as woman there as well. He, he, there's a natural separation. This title is not a condescending title. He is just speaking to her, but not as mother as he started his ministry. Another interesting point is that this is the second to last time only one other time Mary was mentioned in all of the New Testament, and that was in Acts 1.14. Jesus, he, he had died, he had come back to life, and he spent 40 days teaching all the people, speaking about the kingdom of God. Jesus had ascended to the right hand of God the Father and he told his apostles along with many disciples to go and pray and to wait to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. Acts 1.14 says, All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Mary was not the focus of the gospel. Jesus, though, was showing his love for his mother right at that very moment, making sure she was being taken care of. You see, his brothers were not following him at that time. We see in that Acts 1.14 that they eventually did come to know who Jesus really was. But he wanted John to take care of his mother, someone who loved Jesus, someone who knew Jesus. What great compassion. But we also see that Jesus showed his love to the thief on the cross. Now we don't see it in, in the book of John, in the gospel of John. We have to go to another gospel where we see a, a, an amazing account of love shown to a thief. Luke chapter 23. Luke 23, starting with verse 39. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him. Are you not the Christ, the anointed one? Save yourself and save us. But the other thief, the other thief, he rebuked him. He said, do you not fear God since you're under the same sentence of condemnation? We indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man, Jesus, he's done nothing wrong. Verse 42, and the, the thief said to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, I'm guessing, slowly looked at him. Again, many angels probably singing out in this moment. It was probably pitch black outside at this, at this time. Jesus looked at him and said, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. That is tremendous love. Jesus came to this world to save the lost and to show his love in so many different ways, but he also came to submit his life. To submit his life. When Jesus was, was, was preparing for his ministry, he went and fasted for 40 days. And as he was fasting and praying and preparing for his ministry, Satan came to him. And Satan tried to veer him off, get him off focus, get him looking a different direction. Here's what Matthew says in Matthew 4, verses 3 through 4. And the tempter, Satan, came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Jesus was, was really hungry at this time. Bread would be really good. But Jesus answered him, 
It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. You see, Jesus did not come to this world to submit his life to Satan. He didn't come to this world to submit his life to you, to man. Jesus came to this world for one reason, and that was to follow his Father in everything that the Father had said, to follow the God Almighty, the Yahweh. When Jesus was going through agony, understanding that he was about to take on the sin of all, the, all of humanity, understanding that there was going to be a separation from the Father, Jesus prayed, yet not my will, but your will be done. John 6, 38 quotes Jesus saying, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. That's my whole purpose. When we talk about someone who had a singular purpose, a singular focus, we should be talking about Jesus. Yeah, Jesus came here to show us his love and to save the lost. He came here to heal but Jesus' ultimate number one focus was to do the will of his Father. That was his ultimate focus. Whatever the Father asked, he would do. That's why we see so much fulfillment of scriptures. There was over 300 scriptures that were fulfilled in Jesus' life. He fulfilled every single one of them. We see a whole bunch of them in John 19 from the soldiers gambling for his clothes, the drinking of the sour wine, the giving up of his own spirit, dying when he chose to die so his bones wouldn't be broken, and many more. All of these things, they needed to be fulfilled for one particular reason so that the Father could be glorified. When Jesus was on the cross, right before he, he gave up his spirit he took that that last drink to fulfill some scripture he was probably so dehydrated that he needed needed one little thing on his lips and then he shouted out to tell us die which is translated it is finished it is finished that singular word that we translate pierced the heart of everyone who was there it was pitch black out earthquake had already happened the, the, the curtain was torn from the top to the bottom people were committing their lives to Jesus Christ right then and there as they witnessed Jesus saying forgive them for they know not what they do the centurion was scared he, he, was, he was a powerful man. He was scared because he knew what was happening. He knew that something more than what he was about was happening right there. And Jesus said, it is absolutely finished. It's done. Everything that needed to happen has now happened, and I could say, it is done. Mission accomplished. I fully submitted to the Father, and I paid the debt in full. You see, the night before, the night before he was crucified, he was praying. He was praying, and in John 17, verse 4, Jesus says, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Jesus was born on this earth with a mission to accomplish, to pay the debt that was owed to the Father for the sin that began with Adam and Eve. And that was passed all the way on. Jesus came to this world so that he could live an absolutely perfect life. That he could die even though he had never sinned. Jesus came to this world so he could teach us how to love. Because he was willing to submit to his Father in heaven. Why did he do all that? He did it to save your life to save your life. Romans 3.23, friends, says it very well. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
That means that you are a sinner. And that you are a sinner. And that you are a sinner. And that I am a sinner. All have fallen short of the glory of God. If we sin one time, we're guilty of all. None of us can do it. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 20 says, Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. There's not one righteous. Did you know that you need Jesus? Remember Abraham? There's that story. Abraham, he, he, was, he was asking God to, to deal with, uh, not deal harshly with Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, oh, okay, if there's 50 righteous people, are, are you going to kill them? Uh, surely I, I'm not going to kill them if there's 50 righteous people. It gets it all the way down to 10. If there's 10 righteous people, are you going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? No. You know how many righteous people were there? None. Jesus is the only righteous one. He's the only righteous one. I've talked to many people over the years, and they've told me all the great things that they've done. Oh, I've given so much money to that charity. I've gone to church every single time the doors are open. I, that guy that's on the corner, I, I went and got him food the other day. That was good. Yeah, you, you know, I, I don't watch that many bad movies. Sometimes rated R. I, 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 don't, I, I don't cuss that often, just the little ones. I only drink occasionally, and I never do drugs. Oh, I wouldn't do any kind of thing like that. And did you see those people down the street? Man, I'm way better than them. And maybe some of those things are good, but they don't matter. None of that matters. It doesn't matter how much you give and how much you, you help and how much you do, you cannot do enough. Your debt is too great. It'd be like if, I, if my family, I've got a pretty big family, so if all 17 of us went out to Texas Roadhouse, I'd have a couple rolls. And we went to Texas Roadhouse, and, and the bill came. From experience, I know that bill's probably going to be north of 150. And I took that, that bill and I handed it to Maisie. And Maisie is going into fourth grade. I said, Maisie, thanks so much for taking care of this. I don't have anything. Maisie would look at me and she wouldn't have any idea what to do. But you know what? Reggie and Jose, who are freshmen in high school, they'd be like, oh, okay, okay, let's, let's figure this out. Maybe we could get some money from some people. You see, the older we get, the more we think we could figure it out. I, I could figure out how to pay this. And then we, when you get our age, oh, yeah, I, I'll get that. Let me pull out my debit card. Maybe I even have the cash in my pocket. And I'll take care of that. You see, that's not the way sin works. Just like Maisie could not pay that debt, we can't wash enough dishes to pay that tab. We can't do it. We can do it over and over and over and over, but it won't work. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. We deserve death. Maisie, because she cannot pay that debt, deserves death. That is why every single year, every single year, Israel, they weren't celebrating the Independence Day. They were celebrating the Day of Atonement. And they would get this beautiful, perfect lamb. And they take this lamb and they take it into the, into the place to sacrifice it. And the high priest would take the lamb and kill the lamb. And the blood would be poured. And he'd walk out. And he would yell out to all the people of Israel in Hebrew, it is finished. All the sins of all the people were, were symbolically taken on by that lamb. 
The only problem was they had to do that over and over and over and over. There is never a way to put a real gap in that chasm. But today, today we celebrate the great high priest. The great high priest who proclaimed with a loud shout, It is finished! To Telestai! Everything has been taken care of. All your sin was paid for on the cross. Jesus took care of that debt. He would take that bill right from Maisie and he'd say, I got this one. I got this one. And there's more where that came from. He would take care of everything. And you know what? He has taken care of your life. Even if it's an absolute mess, he could take care of that debt right now. No matter what's going on in your life. No matter how bad things are, no matter how, how, how good things are going, you can't be that perfect. Maybe you don't have any money. Maybe you have tons of money. Maybe you know how to pray. Maybe you don't know how to pray. Maybe you don't know the Bible at all. Maybe you read the Bible constantly, but maybe you don't know Jesus Christ. It is about a personal relationship. It is about coming to him and humbling yourself before him. Jesus welcomes you to come to him. I mean, we talked about the thief on the cross. The thief on the cross, man, his life was a mess. And everyone could see it. Everyone who was walking by on that busy street could see that guy, <laughs> he's a mess. He's bleeding and hurting. He must have done something pretty bad to get on the cross. He made many poor decisions but something the Holy Spirit worked in his heart in that moment in time maybe it was the witnessing of all the things that were happening and that thief on the cross looked at Jesus and he said I've done a lot of bad things and I'm here on this cross for a purpose it was because of the things I did but you you're God you, are, you have a kingdom that's not even of this world. And then he asked Jesus one simple thing. We've already talked about it. He asked Jesus one simple thing. Would you remember me when you get to your kingdom? And that's it. Jesus came to this world to save you. He wants you to humble yourself. He wants you to, to trust that he loves you. He's here to heal you and to welcome you in with him for eternity in paradise. Perhaps you're just like the thief. Maybe your life is a mess. And today is the day of reckoning. You don't have to live in that debt. Jesus paid it all. It is finished all you have to do is accept that payment that's it 